Well, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. I know it's a beautiful day and to take the time to come out to learn more about ISD um, really is uh, very welcoming and I appreciate that. Um, so I work for early education and childhood development and uh, I'm a social worker. So I, my role in ISD is actually as a coordinator for First Nation ISD. So um, I've been asked to present on this topic tonight and I cover from uh, Oromocto to Madawaska in my role, but I'm gonna talk tonight about the general services of ISD and, and I'll touch a bit about the First Nation piece as well. And if you have any more questions about that, I'd be happy to, to cover that. If there are questions that I'm missing in the chat, I'm gonna, if you see me looking down, I'm looking at my other screen to, to make sure that I'm not missing any of the, any of the chat discussions. But if I do, please just uh, remind me, speak out, and, and we'll try to keep this as interactive. It's a small group of us. I think you know I'm, we can do that, and uh, I'll uh, we'll do the best we can to to have conversation along with this presentation. So I want to acknowledge um, the First Nation people of New Brunswick, uh, especially during these times with uh, everything that First Nation people are facing. So that New Brunswick is situated on unceded and non-surrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq, Holistique, and Passamaquoddy people. The treaties of peace and friendship signed in 1725 and 1726 between the British Crown and the Wabanaki did not deal with the surrender of lands and resources, nor did it shift the ownership of the Crown. Rather, rules were established for an ongoing relationship between nations. We all must respectfully acknowledge this and our roles in healing and reconciliation between the nations. So I really like this, uh, this quote, small acts when multiplied by millions of people can transform the world by Howard Zinn. And I think it's a powerful quote when we think about ISD, integrated service delivery, because as we learn more through this presentation, it's gonna be clear that there's so many parts to integrated service delivery from families roles in integrated service to departments, uh, community, it really does um, have a powerful statement when we, when we talk about this. So getting to the nitty gritty, when we talk about, you know, what exactly is, uh, I'm just gonna minimize this so I can see a little better. Um, what is ISD? And, you know, I'm gonna apologize for it right off the bat <laughs> or speak to it. One of the things when I first came to work for ISD that I will tell you, and you'll notice it through this presentation, ISD is probably one of the most known for agencies for acronyms. So you'll see us talking about it. There's, there's acronyms for everything. And when I first came to work, I actually had a little glossary um, to go to refer to because it everything has an acronym. So integrated service delivery, I'll try to catch myself so that I can say the actual words for uh, what ISD is. So it's the creation of the integrated service delivery framework. And it was in response to the Ombudsman's um, and Child Youth Advocates recommendation. There was four reports created um, to address some issues and it was connecting the dots report, the Ashley Smith report, Department of Education Early Childhood's McKay Report, Department of Health's McKee Report. And all four of these reports identified that departments needed to be speaking to one another. They needed to be sharing information. Because what was happening is children were slipping through the cracks. They were, um, part, departments were having pieces of information that weren't connecting to the other departments. So it was this recommendation of the Ombudsman and Child and Youth Advocate that, it, that ISD be created to deal with just that, that the, that the departments start talking to one another more. So these reports identified the need for the ISD partners to work collaboratively and to share information and to coordinate services for the best outcome for, for children in New Brunswick. The child-centered approach for ISD services uh, focused on that every child would hit the right door when they needed it at the right time. 
So th this next frame talks about what departments are involved in ISD. So the departments that we see involved typically in an integrated service delivery are social development, health, education, early childhood development, public safety. And they work closely together to deliver integrated support services to youth with complex needs and to ensure that a step care pathway, I know this is another one of those words that we'll talk about as this uh, given an acronym of it, SCP, provides um, culturally relevant services to Indigenous youth and their families. And that was uh, helped to be defined by the Indigenous Guidance Team, which was um, developed to provide recommendations to us on how to do that in a, in a very specific way. So you'll see these departments as they roll out to be ever-changing because these four or five departments that came together after the Ombudsman's report came out and said that these departments are the one main departments that we see working kind of in silos before ISD need to work together more closely now to make sure the children have the best outcomes. Um, we're finding as the years have come on, uh, ISD has been in place since 2008, that there's many, many stakeholders that are involved in services now too. So several agencies, I mean, this one is considered a stakeholder. Adoption uh, New Brunswick Foundation would be one because we're, we're getting education services out there in something that, we're, that I'm doing tonight, just providing education on ISD. That's, that's an example. So uh, the next slide talks about what the Indigenous Guidance Team is. So it was, that was a key piece that was added to ISD um, because when ISD came out uh, back in the early 2000s, the key component that happened was that Indigenous people were invited to the table to talk about um, what active part Indigenous communities would have in the ISD framework. So the IGT is a group of 12 Indigenous people whose mandate was to provide feedback and recommendations on step care pathways. And we're gonna talk more about what that looks like as the slides develop. So the step care pathway involves four government um, departments and, um, and it, the communities that the IGT developed was to work within the community to make sure that culturally safe programs were involved. And the IGT, prepared a document with um, myself and, and a few others to talk about 35 recommendations to make sure that culturally safe programs were, were in place for uh, New Brunswick First Nation children. And that's all part of, of the ISD so that that approach can happen for Indigenous children as well. So when we talk about the ISD approach, um, the focus there is to make sure that that the prevention is early and interventions are early, that there's a holistic team based approach, that the bringing services directly to children, youth and their families, that is strength based and that there's a development of a common plan. And we talk about common plans a lot. And I, I'd like to talk, stop and kind of pause about that a little bit, because you'll hear common plan mentioned when we talk about ISD services. And uh, that is basically talking about bringing all of those departments together and anybody else that touches the child's life um, to wrap around services around that child with a common plan to make that child's life uh, more, more um, supportive. And we talk about continuous case management and following up with that case management. And, uh, and we talked about the wraparound services and child and youth family-centered approaches. The ISD approach is about the right service at the right time and the right intensity. And the vision of ISD is about having a healthy psycho psychological and well-being resilience for all children and youth for ISD living in New Brunswick. So there's five principles of ISD and that's to be child-centered, child-focused, strength-based, respectable, accountable, and living with empathy. And uh, if you're working with children, these principles need to be in place at all times. 
And, it, and it's important that uh, workers working in the ISD keep that in mind. So our next uh, slide talks about what is the NOE or step care. So it used to be that the NOE, the network of excellence is in, and now it's called step care, um, step care pathways. And that uh, was created to provide a continuum of services for children and youth in New Brunswick with complex needs using collaborative recovery oriented approach. And step care seeks to improve and enhance service delivery to children and youth with trauma informed integrated strategies involving assessment, enhanced treatment services and transition from higher levels of service to lower levels of service. So we call it the stepped up or the step down approach. And with many goals um, of looking for the child to have the best support that they can within the schools and the community. When we look at this uh, step care service, we kind of want to see it and we'll see it in slides coming up in, where it's almost like a step ladder. So the Network Center of Excellence, um, you know, it used to be called the Network Center of Excellence and now Step Care Pathway. We want to see, you know, one level of care of being what the child might see for the primary care of um, service where, you know, it might be something that could be dealt with at the school level. And then the next level of step level would be if they need to go, yeah, there we go, that's, that's, the, that's the slide. So the, the first level of care would be at this, the ESS education support services. And that would be your, your first step. So they're based in schools, every school has one. And um, let's say you have a child, Johnny is experiencing some problems at home, maybe having some anxiety, difficulty sleeping, then comes to school and might start acting out, can't concentrate, difficulties uh, getting along with some, some of his peers at school. And that starts to, to overflow in the classroom. So the ESS team would be, um, meeting once a week and, and in that team you're going to have your principal your vice principal resource teacher uh, social worker guidance counselor and they will meet at that team and maybe present johnny at that team and say you know suddenly we noticed that there's some some issues happening here with this child what do you think we can do to uh, support his day and they might make some changes that might mean that johnny needs a break here and there. He might need to go see the guidance counselor and once a week, and maybe we need to break his day up into smaller tasks um, just to make the day more, more easier for him. And that might be the only step that Johnny needs. But if Johnny needs another step, if it's not helping those supports that the education support services put in place, then the next step would be the step up where the referral happens to go to the child and youth team. Now at the child and youth team level, and there's 44 of them in the region, it's based in the community, that child will be referred to the, the team where a social worker might uh, meet with the child to do an assessment and fi find out more of what's happening with that child. And more supports will be wrapped around the child and the family. And maybe the child will step back down and maybe that's all the child needs and they come back to the ESS supports and maybe that'll be all that they need. But let's say Johnny is at the child and youth team and that support is wrapped around at that step. The child and youth team might say, wow, Johnny's still not doing well, still acting out, things are still not great. And we found out that at home, Johnny's experienced a death in the family. Um, it's triggered several other uh, trauma incidents in his life, then they might say, you know, maybe we need to refer Johnny to the integrated clinical team. Now there's 14 of these teams in the province and they're clinical con consultants and they provide support to the child and youth team. And that might look a little different. That's more intensive, more complex services. And that might be where uh, someone like Johnny might need to be assessed in a psychiatric unit, um, it might mean that there needs to be a, um, a clinical group home uh, intake. 
those types of services is what happens at the ICT level. And again, if, if Johnny is there and he's treated and things are happening that he's feeling better, he would step back down to the child and youth team where he's followed by a social worker. And then maybe step down again to the ESS support services where he's back in school and, and doing um, the supports that he needs at the school level. So it's, it's a fluid type of, uh, of trans, transformation that happens from, from one team to the other. And, and somebody may only go from one, but it, goes, it can go back and forth from one support to the other. All right, so we will go to the next slide. So when you look at the interconnected continuum of support services, it kind of goes into a little bit of basically what I was talking about in the previous slide, where we show the, at the ESS level, where that's happening in the schools with that support system there. It's more of a prevention place where it's community-based mental health promotion strategies, early intervention strategies. So a lot of the time it might be how to reduce some anxiety, teaching some, um, some skills, how to handle some stress, and um, those types of things, maybe how to manage some anger, uh, how to take a break. And then when you move into the community supports, into the child and youth side of it, sometimes those, those can flow into the child and youth team too. And it might mean that that uh, client may need to access services like Stan Cassidy or the FASD Center of Excellence. And it can also move into the, um, the ICT where the youth can be referred on to community treatment centers and tertiary care facilities, which might mean something like a psychiatric facility or um, a portage or someplace like that. So looking at what step care looks like in New Brunswick, um, when you look at accessibility, it can be done in person, it can be done on telephone or online. And the chart shows like the health system stakeholder investment to the left with the arrow going up and to on the bottom, the severe intensity and the client needs and readiness. So it, can, it shows how the recovery process can move from left to right, up and down the spectrum and how we can start at the bottom of the step with promoting and preventing and self-directed care, brief services, community services and recovery supports, intensive supports, and the high intensity or specialized supports. So it can start with the level one where it might just mean that um, your client needs to, or child might need just some of that supportive encouragement at the first step. And it may go as high as the top step where, where they might need some more complex um, therapies in place, but they can move back and forth on, those, uh, on that spectrum. So there is a provincial youth treatment center that um, is being built. It was an init initially going to be built in um, the Camelton area, but it's going to be constructed in the Moncton area. Um, the facility requirements and design are just being started. It's pretty remarkable. Some of the, the specs for this, uh, this building I was quite impressed to, to see some of the things that's being put in place for the holistic part of it. Um, you know, whenever you think of a child and three children of my own, and when you think about going into a treatment facility, you want your child to feel um, safe and you want them to have that feeling of comfort and, and not the, the idea of institution. So when they're talking about the holistic, I, I was happy to see some of the things that they're putting in place for that. Um, they completed an intense, extensive consultation process from the former facility. And they're going to, so what they looked at for what was gonna happen in Restigouche, they're going to uh, lose a lot of that to come back to the facility that's coming to Moncton. They require a multi-bed facility to accommodate youth who present with complex mental health needs in community setting. 
specific mandate that relies on community capacity supported by an interconnected network. So this is a slide that talks about the step care model, but it's, um, it's what frame an organization in British Columbia, um, how they developed their um, understanding of uh, step care services. British Columbia is also uh, another province that strongly identifies with the integrative service model. And uh, they wanted to put it in a way that helps us understand the needs in the complex cases. So they have the, um, how it works in intensity across the chart. So starting out with the self-directed help and health for well-being services and moving along to the high intensity mental health services. So they actually did a literature review, this company did to, uh, help uh, the province of British Columbia understand um, what is missing, what the gaps were. And uh, they identified that there's definitely needs to be a, a more improved understanding of the step care model within the agencies of the province and uh, also in how to implement the models. So um, I think it's still, it's, even though, you know, ISD has been in place for, several years now, um, I, it's amazing how many people aren't familiar with how to uh, access the service or that it's even available to, to every child in New Brunswick. So that was basically what came out of that literature review. So, so moving on to um, the next slide. So the interaction between the pathways. So, you know, the community will use a pathway that takes you to the provincial treatment center. Psychiatry will, you know, for treatment processes and pathways, will go to the Rescue Youth Unit, KEPU, um, and what will soon be the, the Moncton facility. And the neurodevelopment pathway will take you to Stan Cassidy and the FASD. Uh, center of Excellence. The coordination of these pathways really comes to be the same in the end because everybody is working together in multidisciplinary teams from families, um, community members to make sure that, that the children get the best service at the best time and the right intensity. And that's what's, what's important that they're able to to make this happen because everybody's talking to one another and ensuring that the service is available for them. Well, I feel like I went through that faster than I intended. I think it's because we're, we're not interacting, but um, so it brings me to the questions and the comments and uh, the final page was for me to uh, leave for, for anybody who has any any questions on the service? So, um, so somebody has asked, is the Stan Cassidy a person or some sort of institution? Sure. Stan Cassidy Center is actually in Fredericton and it's right close. If you, if you go into where the Dr. Edward Chalmers Hospital is, it's a, right beside it. It all looks like it's part of the Dr. Everett Chalmers and it focuses on rehabilitation. And there's a part of the hospital that works on neurodevelopment and especially for children with autism. So they'll do assessments and they actually um, really pleased with how well they work with um, families. So if you have a child that's diagnosed with autism, they will meet with a family and give an education session which is um, really, really nice. The only um, issue that, you know, some of us are struggling with in, in the field is that as far as assessments go, there's, you know, typically 40 or 50 a year that's necessary for uh, like fetal alcohol syndrome or autism. And we, there's about room for four a year because it's so intense and it takes a lot of details. So it's uh it's hard to get people assessed while we're on 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 the topic of the stan cassidy i have actually had two children go through that process with stan cassidy uh, but it was probably before isd they had 
referred by, by a pediatrician. Does can the child and youth team refer to the Stan Cassidy too? Yes, yes, we can. But it, what usually would happen is that they would go through the um, so go through the the child and youth team, but then through the the ICT through the clinical uh, okay. team. Okay. So. I see we have another question there, which is um, when a child has been referred to child and youth team and is being seen without education, being a partner, can a common plan occur? Yes, a common plan can, can occur at any level. Um, so whenever there is a, a child that has multiple people involved in their life, we can request a common plan. So, uh, and I think it's very important that that happens and I'm glad somebody asked that question because um, there's so many times I've seen over the years before ISD and, you know, in this transition, I guess I've been in, in the field for a long time. Everybody has a piece of information and it's so, you know, everybody thinks, well, everyone knows that, but everyone doesn't know that. And a child might open up to one part of it or a family member might open up to one part of it. And, uh, you know, like for my experience, um, of working in First Nation communities, an elder has a huge piece to offer. You know, a community member has a big piece. It doesn't have to be a professional that comes to the common plan. It could be anyone that is involved. And I always say whoever that child has touching their life, I think it's very important that whoever is, uh, the family wants there is very important. Um, I have for those of us who have children struggling in school and may have behavior or special learning plans, how do we make sure ISD involved? So, so if you want to have ISD involved, I think your first step is to make a request to the ESS, again with the acronyms. <laughs> like, I don't know, I want to make an acronym for my name just so I can fit in. Um, so I would, you know, go to your, your guidance, your resource teacher, uh, whoever you're comfortable with at the school level and, and say, you know, I really think it's important that my child is referred to the ESS team uh, to be talked about there to make sure that they're not missing any support that they can get. And uh, because a lot of people don't know that the service is available to them. So I think that that would be an important part. I hope that answers your question. Um, a parent can self-refer as well, absolutely. A parent can self-refer. You don't have to be referred by a specialist or, or anyone, a doctor, um, you know, a mental health specialist. Who knows your child better than you? Nobody, <laughs> absolutely nobody. Like you are the one that knows your child and always trust that, always trust that. So if you're, there's something that you feel needs to be uh, investigated, supported, um, yeah, for sure, reach out. And trust that. So um, what is ESS? That is the education support team. So support services, they change the acronym from time to time. So that is basically what is offered at the school level. So I was talking about earlier as we were going through the, the, um, the uh, PowerPoint, there was like the school one, the child and youth, youth, and then there was the clinical team. So the, the school one is your ESS, and that is your principal, your guidance counselor, your uh, resource teacher. And sometimes they'll have, um, if, if your child has an EA attached to them, that person will be there. Often there's a social worker attending and they sit at the table once a week. And what'll happen is they'll, they'll have you know, if half a dozen names come through and they might be, you know, I have Johnny Smith here and Johnny's mom called me. She has concerns. And the other thing I'm going to put out there that's, you know, I'm coming from, I'm a mom of two ADHD boys. And sometimes you don't want to wait until they've lost half their school year. That's the other thing. Because, you know, a lot of times you don't hear anything until like January before the school starts to pick up that there's a problem or that they kind of notice something's happening. You're going into school, September's coming up, good time to say, hey, I have concerns. Can you bring this up to ESS? That's, that's the time to do it. These are my concerns. We need to address it and they will bring it up. So 
you know, wrap the supports around early. And like I said, they might stay at that ESS level. Maybe they don't need the child and youth level. Maybe they don't need the ICT level, but maybe they do and they can flip back and forth. Yes, educational support services. Um, there's not a minimal age for ESS. If they're attending school, they're at ESS. And sometimes even uh, ESS, uh, I've seen kids even coming from preschool before they enter into the mainstream school, they may be brought up to ESS because they're coming in the fall. So let's say you have a little one who's, you know, right in June. they're getting ready for, for them to come into mainstream school and uh, they'll start preparing. That's a really good idea because if there's some things that you're recognizing or daycare is recognizing and they're like oh this little guy's going to be a handful come fall well it's good to prepare uh yes any child can come up at ess um i have a, a question so from what i've usually seen uh from people i know who are involved um if their child sees someone for the child and youth team, they often see them at school. Is this always the case? So um, uh, probably what you'll see there is because a lot of child and youth teams now since ISD has come into play is that uh, child and youth teams are right at school. That's where their offices are. But not everybody's comfortable with that because not every child wants to be seen taking, being taken out of their classroom. Um, by the social worker. So I, that's, you know, the thing about ISD too is that, um, you know, they wanna be where the child is at. So, and if that means that that child's uncomfortable, then it's important to speak to that if they're seeing somebody from child and youth or even if they're seeing their guidance counselor to keep that in mind that, you know, they don't wanna be taken out of the classroom. They wanna have more discretion because that can really affect how they're how they're doing so yeah a lot of and in some people that's the way they, they want to do that they want to have their social worker see them at school they that's their best bet but it doesn't have to be that way it saves it, some time too yeah but it's about meeting the child where they're at yeah. and, uh, and how would they communicate with the parents if they're seeing the, the child at school like a phone call or something yeah um so you know with today's day and age um email, texting, phone call, um, all those things work. And uh, yeah, so, and ESS is available in French schools and the, and also um, ISD is available in the Francophone district as well. So absolutely. So somebody said, I think you need to find a way to tell foster parents about ISD because some of them really need this and aren't getting referred by social development. Yeah, I, and I agree. I, actually, we're, we're stepping back a little bit even we're telling social development about ISD. <laughs> so as much as social development is part of our stakeholders, there's so much that, that we're teaching. Um, it's in our plan for uh, this fall to, to go in and do a complete teaching session about what, what we offer. So oh, I wonderful. absolutely, yeah, I absolutely agree with that because it's changing. There's so much that's changing about the system and about how we, how we do things that um, it's important. And, and I did say earlier too, that, um, you know, even with the, I don't know if there's anybody here this, that has any first nation interests, but we're developing ISD uh, frameworks in communities now so that they have their very own ISD framework in First Nation communities. So it's, you know, it's uh, parallel to what the province has, but it would be offered in the community by Indigenous people with uh, Indigenous cultural support. So that's, uh, that's how that goes. Um, once you make a request through the school or self-refer, who would contact you and how long would that take? So really depending on if you're at the ESS level, you would probably hear, I'm saying like that day or the next day. If you're at child and youth level, they have to contact you within 72 hours. 
that's the law. What happens after that is you're on a wait for where that uh, child is at based on priority. So if you have a child that's coming in that has, um, yeah, wait a month and months, I hear you, I bet you. So what typically happens is if, so if somebody's coming in suicidal, they're going to the top. If somebody comes in who's got depression and anxiety, they're, they're staying down. And sometimes I've had uh, clients that I refer to private care because um, it's like they're waiting a year. So if they can get in private, they can get in next week. We're doing private. So that's sometimes how it works. So uh, grandson is First Nation from Marmacto and lives in foster care. Yeah. So living... So living in Oromocto and lives in foster care, he can access um, ISD work. Yeah, include private practice. Absolutely. And, it, and um, I'm just responding to Carrie. If um, I can leave my phone number here and if you needed some help with that First Nation piece, um, I can certainly help you with that if there's something that, that your grandson needed. So... Um, Will ISD work with and include private practitioners? They, they do work with it in some ways. What typically happens is um, if a private practitioner is involved, they'll close the file because they can't have two therapists working on the same file. It's, it's unethical. So that's, that's usually what happens there. Private adoption still seem to have silos where social development, not sharing with teams. And <clears throat> that's, um, I want to write that down. Do you mind if I share that, Carrie? Is that okay with you? I think that would help me with about private adoptions. Okay. Because it's important for us to know where the gaps are too. Like that, that teaches us a lot. Um, and that, that's been a big issue and, and really in the, the whole creation of ISD came from the lack of sharing. It really did because that's where, when they looked at what happened with Ashley Smith and, um, with other children in the system, it came down to people not talking to one another and not sharing. So if that's a real important piece that we, we need to continue to address. Um, I have another question. I did not know myself about the more, you know, intense services. Uh, I know that a lot of people wouldn't have known about that. How do they make a decision of that? Is that sort of something that would happen at a common plan with all members of the team and the parents making that decision? Yeah, there's always a common plan. And um, then it goes to the, the clinical team, the integrated clinical team. And like there's 14 of those clinical teams in the region. So after you, you know, step up to that level of service on a complex case, after a common plan has been developed, um, then that clinical team meets and um, makes a decision on, you know, this child being transferred into that tertiary service. So, you know, if you, if you have a child who's, um, needing psychiatric service or hospitalization or assessment at QQ or uh, portage, any of those complex multidisciplinary team services, that's where it happens. It's at that ICT level. And then they refer them to that facility and uh, it happens there. So what, what I like about that is that after that happens in the old days, back in my early social work days, it was it used to be the child gets released from those facilities. The facilities were similar and happen regardless, but the child used to get released from those facilities and go home. And it was like, just assume, ah, they're healed. And we all know that it doesn't work like that because the child needs healing, the family needs healing, you know, the school needs recommendations. There's huge bridges to that. So what 
we know now in the stepped care piece of working and things is that after it goes to the tertiary service is that then you step down to your child and youth team. You step down to your ESS. So those supports are in place to wrap around you and your family because you don't just go home. <laughs> you have to go home with therapies and supports and community-based programming and that kind of thing. So that's the difference. I hope that answered your question. Mm -hmm. It does. Are there any other questions? You can ask them in the chat or if you want to unmute yourself, you can ask them out loud if that's easier too. I'm going to put my phone number down here. If anybody has any um, you know, thing that they feel more comfortable calling me on or um, if there's um, anybody who has the First Nation piece that they had questions about, please feel free to call me on that. And I can also give you my email. And I hope that is helpful. There. There's a couple of questions. Oh, sorry. Good thing I had somebody keeping an eye on that because of. <laughs> Um, you know, with the new provincial youth treatment center, we'll be able to accommodate more youth, assess more at one time. It seems to take so long right now. You're absolutely right to be assessed by CUPU, and I know they're overwhelmed. Yeah, and this was the, the whole thing of um, the concerns that we had in the front line, too, is that, you know, when you're looking at 40 or 50 people that needed assessment, two children that needed assessments and four are going through, like, you know, it's not, it's not acceptable. So uh, that new facility is supposed to uh, really remedy a lot of that. And um, so we're hopeful for that. The, uh, the thing that, you know, started and and I don't know why they transferred it, it started restitution. Now it went to Moncton. Basically, I guess what what I asked that question was it was about location when they're looking at central needs. Most of the needs are coming from like centralizing from there. So uh, I I'm really hopeful for that, that that does help because you're right, the wait is is long. And um uh, We've also heard that they pretty much shut down in the summer for taking in intakes. So that backs everything up. And for families that are struggling, that's, that's difficult. So we're addressing that too. Um, and then we have, is there a way that teens can help with wait times for referrals to developmental pediatrician wait time currently three years? Wow. Whew. Um, so, that's another one that if it's okay, I'd like to write down. Is that okay, Carrie, if I do that? I don't know if I'm correct or not, but I believe there, are, and this could have changed over the years. At one time, there were only two developmental pediatricians in the province. Well, I thought that there was only one. Oh, but... It could have changed. This is like quite a few years old that I knew that, you know? Um, I know that we are, my counterpart that works with me, we're really working hard on wait times um, and addressing it because there's, there's lots that can be done about the wait times. It's just kind of, uh, there's certain things that, that clog the wait system and uh, that shouldn't. So we're working on that. And, uh, but I'd, I'd like to be able to, to talk about that. Psychiatry is another thing. Psychiatry is a huge wait list because we don't have accessibility to psychiatry in New Brunswick, basically. So somebody has, has messaged me that there are two developmental pediatricians, Dr. Murphy Savoy and Dr. Kennedy. I know Dr. Murphy Savoy's in my region in St. John. Would Dr. Kennedy be Fredericton? Yes, that's correct, Catherine. Okay. Yeah, so that, that leaves a bit of a gap, I think, for some parts of the province. I know it's hard to get those that kind of service. Um, so I don't think there are any more 
questions. Kelly has left her email and phone number in the chat if anybody needs that. Um, and like she said, you can also talk with your child's ESS team at school about services too. Um, I want to thank uh, Kelly for coming tonight. I have learned more than I, I knew it was a little bit about the services, but I definitely did not know about all of them. It's much more extensive than I thought. Um, and it was a it was really informative and a pleasure. I hope like that I'm sure that everything you've told us tonight is going to help the families that have come. So that that's great. Oh, somebody's saying very informative. Thank you. Um, I also, before we leave, I want to, oh, somebody said, thank you, Kelly. I wanted to let you know what's coming up for the rest of this week and next week with the network. So um, on Thursday evening, we have late night talks with Kim, which starts at 8.30. And that meeting is open to everybody in the province. And um, next week we have two meetings. On Monday, we have the adoption adventure, which is open to anybody um, pre post adoptive foster in the province. And that one is in English. And we have the same meeting Wednesday night in French and um, in September, our, we'll be going back to our regular fall programming schedule. And I believe we even, we have a couple of webinars in the fall too. So, um, oh, and one of our webinars, I can't remember both of them, but in the fall, we do have one on the adoption subsidy and the other one is from mental health. And we have people thanking you, Kelly, and thinking it was a lot to learn. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Very informative. So people are really happy. Thank you for coming. And um, like people can reach out to her. And if I hear of any questions too, I will follow up with you too, Kelly. It was a pleasure meeting you and having you here this evening. Thanks. Well, thank you to everybody. Very good to, to speak to and you. And like I said, feel free to reach out to me. If I can help, I will. Oh, fantastic. And thank you, everyone, for coming on this beautiful August evening. And if you have any questions about the network or coordinators, you can reach out to me. So um, have a good evening, everyone. Good night. Bye. Good night.